Hi, everyone. I'm Philip Shields. How's your heart? Surely we all agree it's the most important organ of the human body, along with the brain, I guess. Levit Leviticus 17:11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood, of course, is governed and controlled by our hearts. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is lab, and in the Greek New Testament, it is cardia, where we get cardiology and cardiac arrest and so on. Now, in fact, spiritually, we're supposed to have a heart just like God's own heart, a pure heart, like David was a man after God's own heart. And we're supposed to have a mind, okay, you have the brain and you have the heart, a mind which is like Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ, Paul taught us in Philippians 2.5. The two most important organs, both physically and spiritually, have to become like God's heart and God's mind. Well, our hearts, spiritually at least, are also very important to God. God's word mentions the heart, believe it or not, over 800 times. Our heart, depicting spiritually our innermost self, what we really are deeply like inside, is critical to God. So in a sermon on the mount, Yeshua said, Blessed are the pure in heart in Matthew 5 8 blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God it implies that and only they shall see God the pure in heart in God's word one's heart stands for our inner man our inner self what we're really like inside it's the seat of all sin according to Matthew 15 for out of the heart proceeds Actions like murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, lying, blasphemies. And the first thing he mentions is evil thoughts, because evil thoughts lead to evil actions. But a pure heart is also the seat of beautiful, godly actions and living as well. For out of the heart of a righteous man proceeds blessings, good works, right living, good words, speech seasoned with grace. Well, many people have duplicitous hearts, meaning sometimes it seems they're wonderful and sometimes their heart seems <laughs> evil. So your heart is what God looks at if, you're, if we're accepting and turning to his righteousness or not. Our hearts can also be influenced by God, as we're told in Exodus several times in the, the book of Exodus, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I'll put all the scriptures in the notes. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 9.12, I think, the first place where that's said, and 10.1 and other places. But then again, there are many scriptures that say Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Exodus 8.15 and verse 32, for example. So, hello again, everyone. I'm Philip Shields, founder and host of Light on the Rock. And I'm assisted so well by Scott and Brandy Doucette. They post the audios and produce the new videos we're, we're making. I'm so proud of what the work they're doing. It's a lot of work, and I'm going to do this one as an audio, and we'll probably do two out of three video, and then one out of three being audio going forward. So would you check both, the audio and the video? This is the first audio in a while, but I'll, I will be doing new audios from time to time, especially ones that don't lend themselves to having a lot of pictures or video. So thank you for coming to Light on the Rock, all of you from all over the world. Thank you. If our sermons are blessing you, helping you, Please tell others about us as well, and keep watching, keep coming. Also be watching and reading our new blogs, short reads about the Bible and world news events. I have a blog I'm going to finish tonight, God willing, uh, that uh, a message that Nebuchadnezzar might have for President Trump. Trump. I think you'll find it interesting. King Nebuchadnezzar of Daniel 3 and 4 and Daniel 2, but especially in Daniel 4. Anyway, Check out the last few we posted in the last few sermons. Let's get back to the heart. Your heart, again, represents the real you, your true character, your true motivation, your attitude. So Yeshua said things like, for out of the abundance, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What fills your mind, what fills your heart is what you talk about. And he also said in Luke 12, 34, where your, what you value in life, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So God the Father is looking for rulers and priests to reign with his son, to marry his son. I've given several new sermons and videos about the wedding of the lamb. I hope you watch those. I've been getting some good feedback 
people emailing and calling me, telling me that it's really helping them, inspiring them. Hope you watch those. And what he looks for has never changed in a in a ruler, a priest, a wife for his son. When God told Samuel to go anoint one of Jesse's sons, we'll read it completely later. He said to be looking for a man according to my own heart, a man according to God's own heart. That's that's not changed. You and I, future kings and priests with Christ, will also need to be just like that kind of person, a man or a woman after God's own heart. You can write these verses down. We'll read them later. 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14. 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14. And Acts 13, when Paul was talking about it. Acts 13, verse 22. God picked a man after his own heart. God says he'll write his law in our hearts, our innermost beings. God says he'll take out a heart of stone, give us a heart of flesh. Peter, go back and if you have a Bible handy, flick to the back of the Bible, 1 Peter 3. Verses 3 to 4, but it's right near the end, just before maps, in <laughs> the book of maps. Anyway, <laughs> Peter tells women, don't focus on outward beauty. Don't be overly concerned about what you're wearing today or in front of all the other women at church or what jewelry you'll wear today or how you'll look in the mirror. But they do. You can't help that in women, it seems. Peter says, don't. Don't do that. But quoting him in 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, he says, but let it rather be the hidden person of the heart, the part you can't see, the part that God sees that we can't see. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times, holy women who trusted God adorned themselves and goes on from there. And it's clear that God wants men with beautiful hearts too, not just the women, beautiful, pure hearts. So do we have beautiful, clean, pure hearts? Do I? God would rather that we be physically unattractive, but have wonderful, clean, gorgeous, open, loving, wonderful hearts, pure hearts to him that he sees. So one of the most famous parts of Yeshua's teachings is found in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And there he says, blessed are the meek and various things. Uh, Then he goes on to say in Matthew 5, verse 8, the one I want to focus on, we should probably do a whole series on these Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you know the number one cause of death in the USA, at least from 2017, the newest records I could see for the whole country, what do you think the number one cause of death in America would be today? Heart disease heart-related issues, 647,457. 650,000, let's just round it up there. Cancer was 599,000, about 51,000 less. And then in, in the notes, I'll tell you how many died from diabetes, Alzheimer's, strokes, and so on. So the close second was cancer. But if we did all, if we added up all the other deaths by accidents, all of the deaths by suicide, all the pneumonia deaths, all the diabetes deaths, all the Alzheimer's deaths, and all the strokes deaths, all of them combined still come up to less than the death, deaths from heart-related diseases by itself, heart attack and so on. So let that sink in. More deaths come from heart trouble than all the others I've just combined mentioned combined. I didn't combine cancer in there, but everything else just about. If you have heart disease, physical, and more importantly, even spiritual heart disease, you and I will be in trouble. I've had chest pains in the past and was even hospitalized for chest pains. I think it was in 2019. Last year, I think it was. One thing I know, we want a healthy heart. My dad, Clyde Shields, a missionary to the Philippines in San Fernando, La Union, on the island of Luzon, he had a Bible school there and a church and the orphanage, called it Miracle Church or Miracle Bible Institute. And one day he thought he heard a cry up near the top that one of the dormitories was on fire. At least that's what he thought. 
he raced up the steep hill to the top. And as he got there, he had a massive heart attack. He survived that one, but he told me later it was like an elephant standing on his chest, he said. Very painful. Lots of pressure. All the fluids left him at that point. My dad had consider considerable heart damage. He was left with only 10% of his heart functioning. I don't, I don't think that... I, I, it might be what they call the ejection fraction. He had 10%. He had several other smaller heart attacks. And then one day he felt tired. He, he wasn't going to stop. He felt tired. He laid down up there in the Philippines and died shortly after. They found him dead in his bed. So our hearts are... That was sad. Our hearts are incredible machines that God built. How anyone can believe it's just evolved is beyond me. But the heart can be stressed, like my father's was. It can be damaged. And we can die from a bad heart. I could. I really could. I have all the factors of a, some issues of bad heart. Not all of them, but some. So I preach to myself physically but more importantly here, spiritually. I'm not giving this sermon because I think I have a pure heart and need to teach you all how to do that. I'm not. Most of my sermons begin as a Bible study for myself, a corrective one to myself. And so I learned a lot from doing this. And I gave a sermon on this in 1984 in Guyana. And this is a newer, more... A deeper one. I, I, 35, 36 years later, so I hope it's deeper. But spiritual heart disease will also be and was the and was the downfall of many people. So let's talk about that today. Getting rid of spiritual heart disease and having a pure heart. Matthew 5, 8. The best cardiologist I know is God. He made hearts. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think it's implied that only they, only the pure in heart, will see God. No people with impure, dirty hearts, filthy hearts, will be in God's presence. Do you want to see God? Do you want to be in his presence? Do you want to marry his son? Yeshua, God's son, says that our hearts must be pure. Hebrews 12, verses 14 to 16 says, in fact, we have to be holy. For without holiness, no one will see God. So that's part of being pure hearted. Someone who is not pure-hearted will be deceitful, full of guile, hypocrisy, will have lying lips and a profane and unholy life, will not stand before God. You ought to look at Psalm 15 sometime, because Psalm 15, who will stand before your holy, ta your holy place? And it lists he who doesn't take any bribes and he who won't lie and so on. It goes on, I think it says that as well, but anyway, it goes on to list a whole bunch of things. It's a short psalm, just a few verses. Sometime read it, though. It describes those who will come to live in God's presence, who will abide in his holy tabernacle. Also, the words in that psalm, frankly, describe somebody with a pure heart. That's an assignment for you to go back and read Psalm 15. So what is a pure heart? The heart also defines our mindset, our attitude. Our attitude is everything. Our attitude is everything. It's about your innermost being. What you are like really deep down, when you cut away the shaft, shaft, what will be left is your heart. Someone with a pure heart, I'll list a few things, has a great attitude and pure motives, pure intentions. They're up front. There's no deceit. There's no guile. Pure hearted doesn't mean you're perfect, though. King David was said to be a man after God's own heart. But look at some of the sins he committed. But being pure hearted is tied, actually, to the meaning behind the days of unleavened bread. What you see is what you get. There's no hypocrisy. There's no uh, fluff. We're supposed to be unleavened people all our lives. There's little or no hypocrisy. I say little or no because if you define hypocrisy as saying and saying you believe something but doing something else, all of us, because we're not perfect yet, all of us by that definition have some hypocrisy. Maybe I'll have to give a sermon on that. We don't want to be hypocrites. But unless you're perfect, you are, to some degree. But a pure-hearted person, his intention is good, his heart's good, 
although he can't always fulfill it perfectly, as David could not either. A pure-hearted person is not two-faced. A pure-hearted person is the same when he's around all the people at church who know him, as he or she is when they're all by themselves, far away from the people who know them, when they think they're all alone. There's no difference in their conduct. There's no difference in their actions. I'm still working on that one, honestly, frankly, because becoming more and more like God takes time. Pure hearts are people whose heart is in what they're doing and saying. When we come before God with all our heart, God says, give me your whole heart, all of, all of it. Let's face it, that's what the first great commandment is, right? You shall love the Lord your God. It starts with, hear, Shema Israel, Yehovah our God, Yehovah Hechad, Hechad. Alone, it could also mean Yehovah alone, okay? He's, uh, he alone is your true God. Um, you shall love, it's translated as, as one, Yehovah is one, it can also mean alone. You shall love Yehovah, your, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words I command you today shall be in your heart. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 6, I just read. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 6. It's called the Shema, the Hear, O Israel. Love God with everything you've got in your heart. <clears throat> but as I look around, excuse me for the coughing there, I don't see a lot of brethren with a lot of genuine gusto for Jehovah. Sometimes I'm one of them who sometimes gets a little bored or a little down somewhere in there. And uh, our husband Yeshua has some tough words for people of Revelation 2 and 3 uh, Laodicea, for example, was lukewarm. Oh, hum, but they thought they were okay. That didn't please God. And the first group, Ephesus, had a ton of zealous work. They were active. They were busy. But you've lost your first love. They were like a wife who does all the chores, irons the shirts, wash the, wash the floors, cook the meals, did the dishes. But her heart wasn't in it anymore. She'd lost that loving feeling. And even loving was more a matter of doing her duty. And then, then because she was madly in love still with her husband. And, and Yeshua looked at Ephesus and said, you're doing all the hard work. You're wonderful that way, but you've lost that first love. You're not excited anymore. So be sure that's not you and me being described here. But we do know that in the Bible end time days, and we're living in Bible days, I mean, people millennia from now will, will say, man, you, you, what was it like living in Bible days? Referring to our times, so much has happened in just the last seven months. I'm giving this in August 2020. And this is the year of COVID. This is the year of all these things going on, all the protests. We all need we we all need to repent of our lethargy, repent of our lack of wholeheartedness, okay, and become more kind of a bride that Christ is looking for. Now, someone with an impure heart will sometimes, even when things are happening or being said that you disagree with will just go along to get along. But in his heart, or in his heart of hearts, uh, they might hate some of what's going on. So their attitude isn't good because outwardly they smile and get put on a good face, deceive everyone that they're with whatever's happening, whatever's going on. Sometimes we have to speak up and stand up for what's right. So just like someone with a bad human heart, a flesh can seem okay. Next thing you know, they're having a heart attack. That can be the same thing spiritually. Now, here's the problem. Mankind on our own, we have a heart described in Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart of carnal man, the heart of man not yet touched by the life of Christ, is described in... Je I, that's an important thing I just said. It's describing the carnal heart. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 to 10. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And desperately wicked. Okay? I, Jehovah, search the heart. I test the mind, the inner motivations, the complete Jewish Bible says. And I give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Or the complete Jewish Bible says, according to what his actions and conduct deserve. My point here in Jeremiah 17, 9, the carnal heart of natural man is deceitful above everything. 
desperately wicked. Does that describe your heart? You might not think so, but the unconverted heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. might be deceiving you right now. Romans 8, verse 7 and 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it's against God, it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed could be or can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, you might be fleshly, but verse 9, I think it is, goes on to say, but you are not in the flesh if we've been given God's Holy Spirit. So I ask sometimes people, uh, are you in the flesh? They say, well, yeah, you prick my skin with a needle, you'll find out I'm still very much in the flesh. No, in the flesh means you're still living a carnal life against God. You don't want that. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, I just read, but this time I'll read it from the Apologetics, the Holman Apologetic Study Bible. The mind of the flesh, the mindset of the flesh, it says, is hostile to God. Not just enmity, hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable to do so. Those whose lives are in the flesh are unable to please God. So we're seeing the problems and hints to what must be done to get to the point where our hearts can be said to be pure or according to God's own heart. God wants to know. He needs to be sure that we've turned from hostility towards him and his law to a heart that profoundly loves him. Do the things do the things we do show him uh, show him that we want to be intimate with him or do we show that we're distant from him? Paul said his one goal was to show an intimacy that I come to know him and the power of his resurrection. Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11. Our relationship with Christ is to eventually be a marriage. He wants a loving marriage, an active one, which means our hearts have got to be in it. Now, there's what's called the law of first mention. The first time a key word is used in the Bible, uh, it means something very profound, or it does a lot of times anyway. The first time the word heart is used in the Bible, do you have any idea? We've already read that the carnal natural man is hostile to God and his law, his ways. The first time heart is used is Genesis 6, uh, the pre-flood people. Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6. Then Jehovah saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's where heart is used for the first time, describing mankind, mankind that was evil continually. Every intent of the thoughts. And this is how bad it got. Jehovah, I don't know if we can say we're quite there yet in this world. There's still a lot of people who have good intentions and good, good hearts and good thoughts and help out people. In spite of everything we're watching on the news, there's still a lot of good people around. So um, not quite there yet. But Jehovah was sorry, verse 6, that he had made man on the earth. He was grieved where in his heart, in his heart. So mankind's hearts, their mind, their soul, their innermost being, their intentions were evil all the time. It grieved God deeply in his heart, in his feelings, his mindset, his intentions. And then after the flood, not Noah's flood, God's flood, here's something else we learn. This is now the third time that heart is mentioned. The first time is Genesis 6-5. The heart was evil continually, the thoughts. The second time was Genesis 6-6, that God was grieved in his heart. And the third time is Genesis 8, verses 20 to 21. The flood is now complete. Noah builds, uh, they're, they're coming out now of the ark. By the way, you've got to see that ark in Kentucky. It is huge. Noah built an altar to Jehovah, took of every clean animal, of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Jehovah smelled a soothing aroma. And then Jehovah said in his heart, notice by the way that there were clean animals, clean birds, way back then, long before the days of Moses. Anyway, Jehovah smelled a soothing aroma, and Jehovah said in his heart, 
I'll never curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living creature as I have done. And then God later on, I think in the next chapter, I think it's the next chapter, uh, puts out a, a symbol of his covenant, which was the rainbow. Be, I woe to those who use God's covenant symbol for unholy symbols. You know what I mean? The colors and the ranges, the colors of the rainbow should not be used for anything unholy. God is not interested much in how we look to each other. Turn, if you have your Bible, 1 Samuel 16, verse 6 and 7. God was no longer happy with King Saul. So Elohim, or Yehovah, tells Samuel, I want you to go down to Bethlehem. And there's a family there whose head, whose father is Jesse. And I want you to look at his sons and pick a king to replace Saul from his sons. And so the firstborn, tall, big, strong, strapping, Samuel was impressed with the way he looked. And so it was after they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely Jehovah's anointed is before him. The word there, anointed, means Messiah, by the way. It just means anointed. But Jehovah said to Samuel, Don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. Jehovah does not see like you do, like man does, for man looks at the outward appearance. Well, that's all we can look at, right? But anyway, but Jehovah looks upon the heart. So guess what? God changes not. As he's looking for kings and priests for the millennial reign and beyond, he's still looking at the heart, your heart, my heart. So what does God mean to look upon the heart? How are we doing? God's looking at our hearts. It's not just what we do, but what our heart is, what our intentions, motivations are. Let me ask you a few questions to help us look at our hearts. Your acts of service. Are you doing good things to look good to others, to the brethren as you arrive early to set up chairs or serve the congregation at, or even the community at large? Some people think I'm doing light on the rock just to impress people for my own glory. From my heart of hearts, I can promise you it's not that. It's not. I promise you that. And uh, may God be merciful for them for misjudging me and accusing me of that. But anyway, we do have to be careful that when we do acts of service, that our heart is right. You might remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. If you're not familiar with it, read the first 10 or so verses of Acts 5. They had sold some property. This was a time when all the brethren from all around were gathering and living together and, and congregating together. They thought, surely Christ is coming back soon. And so people were donating food and money to the group so that they could be taken care of. So Ananias and Sapphira bought or sold some property they had, and they let it out that they were giving every penny to the group. And they weren't. It was okay for them to keep some of it. They could have said we're giving 50% of what we sold our land for to the group. But no, they said we gave all of it, and that was a lie. Their heart was muddled. And they died for it. So be careful when we serve God. We have to be without guile. No deceit. Uh, you'll notice the, def the description of the 144,000 in Psalm, I'm sorry, in Revelation 14, verse 5. The 144,000 sta uh, standing on the sea of glass in heaven. It says about them, in their mouth was found no deceit, no guile. For they are without fault before the throne of God can only be without fault with the righteousness bestowed upon you by God, by faith. And I've given many sermons on the righteousness by faith. And in their mouth was found no deceit, okay, for they are without fault. And this is also why God tells us he loves a cheerful giver, because he's looking upon the heart. And when we have to give our holy day offerings, remember on, on the holy days, at least three times a year, in Passover uh, season, and then also at Pentecost and also the Feast of Tabernacles. We're supposed to not come empty-handed, but have an offering that we submit to those who are doing that we feel are doing God's work. I thank those of you who have sent some here, a handful of you. 
but thank you very much. Uh, it helps us in our support for a bunch of kids over in Kenya and the, and the, the pastor who's helping out. But notice what it says in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 9. Again, I'm reading from the Holman Bible. Remember this, the person who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will reap generously. Each person should do as he's decided in his heart, not out of regret or out of necessity or by feeling of a duty, but because you're cheerfully giving. God loves a cheerful giver, it says. So another point, why did Christ speak to the Pharisees and call them whitewashed tombs? It's because they were doing all their good deeds to be seen of men outwardly. He said, you're like a, a tomb that's been whitewashed, beautiful tomb, but inside are dead men's bones. That's what he said in Matthew 23, verses 27 to 28. Outwardly, you appear so beautiful, but inwardly, you're just a bunch of decaying bones. We must not be like that when we do good things. I mean, they would even uh, blow the trumpet to let everybody know, apparently, that uh, they were tooting their own horn. That's where that comes from. That they were about to give some donation to the temple or something. So when you worship, when you pray, when you do Bible study, you have to, these have to become our priority, showing we're seeking God with our whole heart, our whole being. God wants our heart. So here's the problem we have. We're still made of flesh and blood. We still have, no matter what Holy Spirit God's given you, no matter what he's given you, you still have a heart, a carnal heart inside of you, as well as, I hope, a new heart, which I'm going to talk about now. But Galatians 5 says these two attitudes, these two natures, Galatians 5, verses 16 to 24, says are fighting each other. I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul said. So even Paul, as converted and spiritual as he was, still said the things I don't want to do, I still find myself doing. I am carnal, sold under sin. Romans seven fourteen. Who shall deliver me from the bondage of this horrible body, of this flesh I have? And carnal hearts are wicked. So anyway, so Paul says we have these two natures inside of us. So how do we get the, the pure heart? We know we have the carnal heart that's hostile to God. And if we start listening to that, you'll go back to that hostility. You will. You'll go back to being bored with spiritual things if you're listening to that side. But if you're feeding the good heart side, if you're feeding the good heart side, you'll find that that's the part that's growing. It's whatever we feed. It's whatever we feed that will make all the difference. So we need a pure heart. So we can see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. But natural mankind has a desperately wicked heart. So what needs to happen? Well, in physical hearts, we now routinely do what's called heart transplants. We can give someone a brand new heart. Well, at least parts of it, some of them are made up of animal parts or hearts, I think. But the first heart transplant was quite newsworthy. It was back in 1967 by a South African doctor named Dr. Christian Bernard, and he had a team of 30 others with him, and they replaced the heart of a 55-year-old man named Louis Washkensky. I should have researched that, see how long he lived after that. So the solution is we need a new heart. Without a new heart, he was going to die, Louis was. So we need a heart transplant. Except in our case, God, I think, keeps that old nature there as well to fight the new nature, so we learn that there is to be a fight. Many of you are living your life without living a life of fight. We have to fight. David knew he had been given a new heart after Samuel anointed him, for God gave him his Holy Spirit, it says in 1 Samuel 16, 13. As soon as God anointed him, he also anointed him with the Holy Spirit. He was, after all, the, the Lord's anointed. But his heart had become corrupted and jaded by the sins he let himself start, start falling into. He let himself lust at probably a very young woman, uh, Bathsheba, taking a bath uh, on her roof. And the, of course, the, the castles, uh, the palace, the palace, I mean, of David was higher up in the land and he could look down and see things. I don't believe necessarily that Bathsheba was trying to entice him as some, some want to justify David, 
Nowhere in the Bible is David being justified by anything. The point is, he called her to him. He commits adultery with her. She gets pregnant. Now what are we going to do? So he brings Uriah, her husband, back right away. Maybe we can make it look like a, an early pregnancy. And But Uriah wouldn't go have sex with his wife that night. He says, all my people are out in the field in enemy land. Why should I have the comfort of home? So he did not go to his wife. David orders him killed. Joab, his nephew, goes along with it, who was the commander-in-chief of the army under David. Finally, the sin is pointed out to David. Was it Nathan? The prophet says, you have been like a man who took someone's only lamb and had that for dinner instead of the many flocks you had, uh, lambs from your many flocks. David was horrified when he realized the depth of his sin. We can read his horror in Psalm 51. Hide your face from my sins, he says to God in Psalm 51, verse 9. Blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10, he says, you should read the whole Psalm 51. It's really when you're repenting or need to repent or think about repenting, read Psalm 51. It's such a beautiful example of the right heart when we're repenting. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a create you make something i need a clean heart renew that spirit in me don't leave me don't cast me away don't take your holy spirit from me verse 11 you can't make your own heart clean enough you can't make your heart new by yourself no matter how hard you try you can't do it there's one creator, and the creator of your new heart is God. God has to give us new and clean hearts that he created, that he made. There's one creator, and we're not it. So that's something we pray for, a clean heart, a new heart given to us. It's what we pray for. Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 27. I want to read that next. This is a prophecy in Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 27, or 26, yeah, 27, that um, it's talking about when God brings back the Israelites and the Jews out of captivity from the lands he had spread them to. They're still coming captivity, brethren. I really believe that. And he says here, Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 27, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And you shall be clean. And I will cleanse all your filthiness from your idols. Verse 26, what I want to get to here, Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart. It's not something they work towards. The work we have to do is to repent and to abide in Christ. And then he will produce the fruits in us. Philippians 1, 11, John 15, verse 4 and 5. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruits. Philippians uh, 1, I think it's 11 or 12, says we produce the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. So I will give you a new heart. I will, I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh. Boy, I wish he'd do that for us now. Maybe he is. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So let me make something really clear. When God gives you his new heart, that heart is not deceitful and desperately wicked and who can know it a la Jeremiah 17, 9. It is not. You think God's going to give you, if, if God says, I'm going to take out of your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, do you think the heart he gives us, the heart that David was praying for, create in me a clean heart, it's going to be desperately wicked? No. 
but we still have that other nature somehow inside of us. The new heart God gives us wants to obey. The new heart God gives us is good. We have to feed it, though. We have to strengthen it. The new heart God gives us wants to worship him. The problem is, for now, we still also have, we do, that old nature, Galatians 5. David said he delights in God's law. The new heart should not be wicked, should not be hostile to God. Proof is that David said, after he had God's Holy Spirit, he said, I delight in your law. All through Psalm 119, he says that. All the way through it. I'll try to put some cross-reference, but you ought to read Psalm 119, all of it, if you haven't read it for a while. And you'll see how much he delighted in God's law, meditating on it and wondering how wonderful it was. Now, once we have the Holy Spirit and our new heart that God created, that God gave us, now we have to fight any attempts by Satan to discourage us. Now we have to start realizing we're in a battle, a war. Are you even aware when you're fighting? And thinking each day you're supposed to be in a fierce battle. You're supposed to be in fierce battles against sin and discouragement and depression and lust and evil thoughts and dissatisfaction and bitterness. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says we're supposed to even arrest every thought and bring it into captivity and to the obedience of Christ. We have to do that much more than we have been going forward, surely, brethren. Once we have that new heart, we have to guard it. We have to protect it. It's like a precious gift from God. But if we're not consciously fighting sin every day, folks, we're toast. There's some great advice given in Proverbs 4, by the way, verses 23 to 27. I'll read part of it here, but I'll put the whole thing in the notes. Above everything else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Your thoughts, your feelings, your moods. Those of you who are in a decent marriage, help each other do that. Help each other. Encourage each other when you see one is down. Let that person talk. Just be there. Just give them a hug. No preaching necessary. Just give them a big hug. Let them get it out and then give them reason, encouragement, why they can restart the day. Guard your heart, for it's the source of life's consequences. That's complete Jewish Bible. Guard your heart above everything else. It's the source of life's consequences. You might want to write that one down, put it on a note, a post-it note you stick on your on your mirror for a week. Read the rest of the next few verses. But well, that's Proverbs 4, verse 23. Guard your heart. Evaluate where corruption's creeping in. Evaluate where discouragement, where temptation's creeping in. Many of you guys and girls probably, ladies, uh, go on the internet and you see things that are really not godly. I don't mean just porn. I mean Lots of stuff that you would not have on if Yeshua was standing right there with you. He is standing right there in you. What are we making him see and hear and watch? We've got to wake up. We've got to wake up. Look what else Yeshua said about the Pharisees who were the whitewashed tombs full of decaying bones. Matthew 23, verses 25 to 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish. Oh, you just had a big meal of lasagna and you had a dish there full of lasagna. And it's like you're polishing the outside of the dish, putting it up in the cabinet. But you didn't clean inside. Inside you're full of extortion, self-indulgence, an old lasagna. Now, I'm not, that, that part's not in the Bible, but that's the point he's making. Blind Pharisee, cleanse the inside of the cup and dish first. Cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside may be clean also. If you're washing inside that well and that carefully, the outside's going to get washed. 
Start inside. Having a clean heart's an inside job. <laughs> okay, it's an inside job. I thought that was funny. But anyway. Um, so my point is we have to guard the heart. We have to realize we're in a battle. We have to be realizing what we're making and trying to let Jesus, Yeshua, see and hear and experience and realize, no, we must not be doing that. We must be fighting temptations to do the wrong thing, to go wrong places on the Internet, to go wrong places with wrong people. We can still be friends of sinners like he was, but not participating in their evil. But our lack of judgmentalness makes them want to be our friend, and they, we then have a chance to talk about the gospel. Then what happens when we do sin? When we're guarding our hearts. An example is given when uh, David wanted to number Israel. His heart wasn't right. I think he was feeling pretty, pretty good about Israel. Man, I have all these hundreds of thousands of soldiers. There's no enemy that can come against me. And instead of giving God the glory, he asked Joab, who protested at first, his nephew again, to go number all of Israel. Joab said, don't want to do that. So, but he did. And it made him feel great about what he'd built. And he was leaving God out. You know, President Trump does that sometimes. I believe God is shaking him up. What did he do over and over? Yes, he's done some wonderful things, I think, for the country, both for the black people and the uh, justice reform and the inner city uh, uh, reformations that he's doing and uh, standing up to China, standing up to NATO, making them pay their bills, their fair share of it. But over and over and over again, I heard him say, I built, I built the greatest economy like the world's ever seen before. This is it. This is what I did. It's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar said when he took all the credit for the glories of Babylon. God took that all away from him for a while. Pride goes before a fall. And I pray that President Trump, there's a verse that says that, pride goes before a fall. I pray that President Trump repents of that, repents of his own rough mouth and language, repents of everything that he is, as you and I had to repent of everything we are when we truly repented, not just what we did or should have done, but what we are, okay? Like Job did, I, I abhor myself. I repent, Okay, I abhor myself. I don't like myself, Job said at the end of the book of Job. So you and I have to stay, take stock. And when we sin, our heart, frankly, should smite us. David's did. In uh, 2 Samuel 24, he just numbered Israel. And the sum of all the men of Judah were 500,000, half a million. And there were 800,000 in the what became the house of Israel. So between them, he had 1.3 million soldiers. David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people, smote him. David said to Jehovah, I've sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Jehovah, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Can you sin or have prolonged wrong thoughts or deeds or inaction? and not be smitten in your heart. If you can, if you can do a lot of bad things for a long time and not be smitten, you're in deep trouble. You're suffering from hardening of the spiritual arteries. You're going to have a spiritual heart attack soon and spiritual death if we don't change. So our Father and Savior are working on our attitudes, on our hearts. We're told that God is faithful to finish what he started in you, Philippians 1.6. Read that verse by yourself, Philippians 1.6, that God will finish the work he's begun in you. Being confident of this very thing, Philippians 1.6, that he who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's called the author and the finisher of our faith. So Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, says to let us weigh, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. We've got to put that, take it off of us and run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It goes on from there, but God will finish what he has started in us, but the more we feed the good heart, the good nature, 
the more we ask for his grace and mercy, the more our hearts will smite us when we do evil. If it's not smiting us, that should be a red, red flag, a real loud alarm going off that we're getting calloused. We're getting calloused. It's not a pure heart. So because David's heart was right most of the time, even when he sinned, God was able to work with him and able to, at the end of his life, still say he was a man after God's own heart. Except in the matter of Uriah. God really, really hated that because most of our sins are unintentional. Most of our sins are sins of weakness. Uh, like we saw Bathsheba on the roof. It wasn't except in the matter of Bathsheba. It was the matter of Uriah, it says. With Bathsheba, it was a temptation that he gave into. It was a sin of weakness. With Uriah, it was premeditated murder. God hated that. And David was punished severely by God for that. So anyway, we go back now to 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 to 14. One of the greatest things said about a man was God's estimation of David, the youngest son of Jesse, who wasn't even brought out to meet with Samuel because he was the youngest son and he was the, he was the baby of the family who was out there watching the sheep. And so Samuel says to Saul, actually this is the part where Samuel had to tell Saul, you've just lost your kingdom. Um, you haven't obeyed God. You've acted foolishly. This is when he went ahead and offered sacrifices instead of waiting for Samuel. For now Jehovah would not would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. For Samuel 13, verse 14. Jehovah has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and he'll be the commander of his people. Because you have not kept what Jehovah commanded you, Saul. Uh -uh. And then Paul recounts the story. And when God had removed Saul, it says when he had removed him, Okay, when God had removed Saul, he raised up for them David as a king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. That's the goal, isn't it? What a great testimony. Was David perfect? No, I just told you he wasn't. He numbered Israel. That caused the death of 70,000 people. 70,000. I'm hoping President Trump does what David did and just goes before God and that death angel who was right there at the what would become the uh, temple site. Please, take my life, take my family's life, but not these, not these innocent sheep. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Take mine, not theirs. And I'm hoping... I'm hoping President Trump will repent of his own sins, that he will ask God to change him, to have mercy on the nation in this COVID mess. Have mercy on the nation in this COVID, in this Wuhan virus. If he wants to stop the virus, if he wants to reverse things, President Trump, that's what you got to do. Do what David did and repent. Anyway, of course, you, I, I could ask you, when you look at your heart physically, what are some of the things we can do that you can do to have a strong heart? Well, you exercise the heart in a healthy way. So we have to do acts of kindness and we have to exercise it. We do resistance training, some, some weightlifting. Don't overdo it. The same way we should be fighting evil, wrong thoughts, like weight training. Do you ever fight evil? Do you find yourself fighting it? Praying for strength. Mark 7, verses 20 to 23. For from within, it's not from outside that defiles a man. Yeshua is saying, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness. All these horrible things that are listed. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. God loves you and me so much that he'll do whatever it takes to get us purified and redeemed. Some of us may have to go through the furnace of affliction to come out pure gold or pure silver with all the dross removed. Like the Laodiceans, God will finish what he started in you, but 
For some of us, it might be going through the fire. If that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. The fire of trial, I'm talking about. The fire of the great tribulation. The fire of being beheaded, if need be. If you want a healthy physical heart, you've got to get rid of negative stress and worries. Otherwise, you're going to have chest pains and eventually a heart attack. Same way we have to live by faith in God. No stress, no worries. Am I perfect there? Absolutely not. I think I'm getting better at it, but I still have to watch that, watch my lack of faith. We have to eat right. So David meditated, fed on God's law and God's words constantly. Read Psalm 119. Feed on the milk of the word. Feed on strong meat too. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3 says, Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Paul adds in Hebrews 5 that at some point we start adding solid food that we may grow thereby. Are we in God's word enough? Are you feeding on God's word or are you feeding more on TV? Are you watching shows on TV nowadays that show nudity? That, that profane God's name, that has all kinds of bathroom scatological words like the F words and others. Just don't watch those anymore. You're feeding that into your mind and it's going to come out and you start talking like that. Feed on the good word of God's word. Feed on positive things, positive quotations, positive words of God. Get rest and peace and quiet. David knew about that. Your heart won't work well if you don't get enough rest and quiet. I find people have constant noise around them. Learn to have quiet. I love going out at night in the lanai, that back area of our home. It's got a beautiful garden there and trees. Used to be a beautiful garden until my dog, <laughs> like chasing lizards all through it. So anyway, we try. But anyway, it's a beautiful place. It's very quiet. Everyone's gone to bed by the time I'm sitting out there. There are no sounds at all except God's creation. I hear crickets. I hear frogs. Just God's creation. And there I sit quietly and meditate and commune with God. It's great for my heart, both physically and spiritually. Usually a little while before that, my wife and I together are out there together. And she goes to bed a little earlier than I do. I need to change that and go to bed with her. If we do these things after we receive our new heart and fight the cravings of the old heart, we will grow in purity, but God's got to give us that heart. So I'm talking to you, talking to me. We've got to wake up, get our hearts back in sync with God. I mean, even when you pray, are you giving God the dregs? The last thing as you go to bed and you're so tired. I found myself doing that. But I was trying to pray as I was so sleepy by then, trying to get into bed. So I started, I started praying a little before I go to bed. I want to give God a better time to focus on him. What's important to you? What do you value the most? Where are you putting your time and your efforts? Because Yeshua said, out of your treasure of your heart, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a deep, deep saying that's worth a sermon. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. How's your Bible study doing? Are you doing even any Bible study during the week? Do you even crack open the Bible every single day anymore? If not, shame on you if you call yourself a child of God. You're anorexic spiritually. You're starving so when do you meditate? When did you last fast? What do your answers to my questions say about your heart? If you aren't studying and feasting on God's word, turning the television off, I'm turning mine off more and more. I used to watch the news a lot. I found it so depressing. <laughs> and I just have turned it off. I, I, I get the main news. People send me stuff as well. Spend the time in God's word. How are your acts of service doing? Remember, the heart's got to be right there. It's got to be right. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 says, I can bestow all my goods. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 13, 3. 
I can bestow everything I've got to feed the poor. But if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. If your heart's not in it, it doesn't mean a lot. Or if you're doing it to be seen and complimented by people and praised, that's also the wrong motivation, the wrong heart too. It's probably best to do acts of kindness and charity in a way, you know, if you can help people, you know, have no money and drop a bag full of food at their door. Don't have to say who did it. How brightly is your light shining to those around you as the world gets darker and darker? God's children's lights need to be shining brighter than ever by our conduct, by our words of encouragement, by our acts of kind service to all those around us, by our words that lift up. Time is short, brethren. God's looking for kings and rulers and priests for his kingdom. Remember, he does not look upon outward appearance like man does, but upon the heart. He's looking at yours and mine right now. He wants to see if you have asked for a new and a clean heart. Even if you were baptized years ago, I did that recently. Father, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Take not your spirit from me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your presence. Make me holy by your presence. I surrender to you. And I want to fight the adversaries more than ever before. I had a prayer similar to that recently. And I, time is short, brethren. You don't know when your next heartbeat will end. He's looking at your heart right now, spiritually. And he decides on who will be doing what, and who will be kings and priests, and who will not. I hope I've given you a lot of food for thought. And that we'll all make course corrections soon and get a new heart and reevaluate our entire lives and see where our hearts really are right now. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want God to look at me and look at you and say, now there go people who are pure in heart, and I'm going to make sure that they see God. 1 John 3, verse 2 and 3 says, We shall see him, for we shall be like him. It's one of my favorite verses. Those who are going to see God are going to be like him, and that's why they're going to see God. We're going to be like him because God will finish what he started in us. Now, we can make it hard on ourselves by fighting sin, but easier for God to work with us. Or we can instead, we can instead make it hard for God to clean us up, make us have to go through great tribulations and bad times. And he will clean us up. We will be there. We will see God. He will finish the work. But focus on him now and ask for that clean heart. Thank you so much. I'll leave it with that. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much. And we just ask that you will, on all those who are listening, do a wonderful miracle. Take from us our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh full of your Holy Spirit. Come live inside of us. We open the door to you. We don't want you outside knocking on the door. We don't want to be laid of sins. We don't want to be people who've lost our first love. Help us grow and change, really change. We need a new heart to do that. And Father, we know you're eager to give us a new heart if we will surrender to you and make Yeshua the Lord of lords in our life right now. Make him the captain of our life, the captain of our salvation. And obey him. Seek his law. Seek his love. Seek his life, seek his way, and seek your way. Come live, Yeshua, inside of us. Come live, Father, inside of us. Come into our hearts. 
Let us live a life that pleases you. May your face shine when you think about us. May you be just so happy with us. In Yeshua's mighty holy name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Father, so much that we can come to you. Thank you, thank you. Amen.